Welcome to Films and Stuff with your hosts, Pete Mitchell and Ethan Hunt. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Films and Stuff. I'm an overly enthusiastic Ethan. I'm sitting across from my partner in crime, MVP, most valuable Pete. Pete, take it away, my friend. We're going to go on our patented ramble today, aren't we? It is patent pending. We're going on the the entertainment ramble, uh, which means we're going to talk about everything, anything under the sun, mostly what we're watching on streaming platforms. Surprisingly, as poor as the quality in cinemas is right now, there's actually a lot of stuff streaming that's pretty good, at least high profile. Yeah, let's touch upon that. Uh, that's a very interesting comment you make. So it's not that cinema showings have been poor per se. They it's have. just that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be the narrator in the background. <laughs> they have. You're Ron Howard in Arrested <laughs> Development. <laughs> I'm Ron Howard in Arrested Development. <laughs> the cinema showings have not been bad per se. They have been. <laughs> the thing is that they're not necessarily the most interesting of films that Ethan and I would typically watch. Let's put it this way. It's a rainy day. Your internet is out. You look at what's going on in the cinema right now. You're like, look, I'll, I'll just go see two shows back to back matinee. By the time I get back, my Wi-Fi will be up or the rain will be stopped. Are you excited about seeing any two movies in the cinema right now? Back to back. Despicable me Four. come on. And, and, Inside Out 2? I mean, we could definitely see those movies back to back, and we probably wouldn't like slit our wrists while doing it. <laughs> okay. But, but that's not really like a compelling, like, oh man, I'm so jazzed to go see Despicable Me 4. I've you know, this isn't like Endgame 2. It's not, you know, the new Mission Impossible. It's not another Fast and Furious or Dune or it's Okay, fine. We'll see it. It's out. It's despicable me for. Yeah, it's been a bit lackluster. And even the movies yeah. that I have seen in the cinemas have been surprisingly not super duper fantastic. Right? I saw Furiosa. And I mean, spoiler alert, it was supposed to be on our top 10 lists for both of us. I don't think it's going to make the top 10 this summer. Oh, that's awful. Yeah. It was fine. Don't get me wrong. I thought Anya Taylor-Joy was great in it. I thought Chris Hemsworth was a sociopath in it. Do I think it's worthy of being a top 10 movie? I don't know. I don't know. George Miller's movies, though, have always been based on the visual. Yeah, a little bit more right. bombastic. Yeah, you're right. You know? It's never really been about the plot, which there is none. It's never really been about the dialogue, of which there's even less. Yeah. It's always been about the stunning visuals and the color and the, you know, that. Yeah. Okay, so in contrast to the lackluster cinema showings, what do you think of what's streaming right now? Streaming is interesting. I don't know how great the shows are, but I do know that there are quite a few high-profile ones. True. So, Acolyte, I have been very public about my disdain for the Acolyte. It's really reached the level of disdain. Yeah. To use a phrase I use comedically all the time, it is El Pantalones. I like it. So, you're using a phrase that you've coined. (laughs) <laughs> you're paying you're paying your own royalty. That's right. To use a phrase that I've coined. I like that. Give yourself credit. Thank you. Thank you. Are you up to date on how many episodes of Acolyte have come out? Five now? Six, I believe. Oh man. And there's eight in the season? Eight in the season. This bears repeating. We've been very, I think, objective in the fact that we are not the top one percent of Star Wars fans. Yeah. But we are definitely, in the world population, the top 5%. Yeah. 10 if you want to give us even less credit. And I've watched three of six episodes of Acolyte. You've watched how many? I've watched six of six. (laughs) 
it was such was such self-loathing you admit that. <laughs> I do because I went I specifically said to myself I wasn't yeah. going to watch any of them after the first two. You even said it to me. Yeah. Not just to yourself. You said it to me. And then I went ahead and just got <laughs> caught up because come on. Ah, there's something to that. You're not happy with it. No, I'm really not. But you still can't stop yourself. But I still can't stop myself in the sense, not as a fan of Star Wars. I can't stop myself as a representative of the Films and Stuff podcast. Because Kathleen Kennedy would tell you, aha, you secretly do love it. You're just complaining, but deep down, you keep coming back for more. You secretly do love it. See, we've made a great, compelling show. But you're yeah. saying you're not you're not doing it for her. You're doing it just for the art of the podcast. Yes. Okay. That's the big thing. You've kind of opened something up. So if we're taking Disney Plus, on the Disney side, we've got The Acolyte, which neither one of us is favorably reviewed. And on the Hulu side, we've got The Bear. For the rest of us internationally, it's also out on Disney+. Plus. Season three of The Bear, right? Loved it. How many episodes are out? All of them. I've watched two. Okay, so cousin, please, don't give me any spoilers. That's actually two big things on Disney. Yes. Three, if you want to count a show that's not current, but that we're watching, it's Shogun. Ah, yes. You're right. Let's flip to... Amazon? What are we watching on Amazon Prime? So I have bad news for you on Amazon Prime. Oh, no. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Very recently, they released stealthily The Outer Range. Yeah. Season two. Yeah, I have not watched it yet. Well, it just got canceled. So season two is the last. Season two is the last. Oh. Look, I'm really looking forward to season two, but I cannot say that I envision this to be like a seven-season series. I think that's probably about right. Yeah, okay. Let's revisit this topic after you finish the last episode of season two. Oh, that seems like a spoiler. I know your perspective is, hey, if they've canceled it, I'm not even going to watch the season. Why should I buy in, you know, when I know it's going to end, right? I mean, they did that to the peripheral. I love your relationship style. Are we going to get married? Can't tell you for sure. I'm out. <laughs> like, I'm out. Now we're going to waste my time. If this isn't going all the way till death do us part. Look, I'm very, <laughs> I'm very open to any kind of relationship. I just need to know the boundaries from the outset. Yeah, I'm okay? out. I need to know the potential end games from the outset. I'm not saying yeah. you have to marry me at the end of this relationship, but I have to know that that's a pathway. Yeah. You've done that before where you're like, hey, it's been canceled. I'm just not going to watch the next I'm season. I'm out. Yeah, what's the point? <laughs> what's the point? Because the problem is, the, here's the problem. They end it after the series ends. They never cancel mid-season. And Hmm. if you cancel mid-season, what that at least allows you to do is wrap up loose story ends by the end of that season before they finished filming. But in today's streaming era, where you film eight episodes, put it in the can, put it out on streaming, and then you leave things open-ended, like the peripheral, for example, and then between seasons one and two, you're just like, you know what? We're not doing it anymore. What the hell, man? I'm I'm sorry that you got spoiled by Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, where they've got seven seasons to give you the entire universe and tie up every character arc in a nice way. You must have hated Sopranos. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but but you know what I mean, right? Like I'll give you a, an example I can think of is a show like Scrubs, right? It was, for me, one of the best sitcoms I've ever seen. They canceled it at the end of the last season, whenever it was in the middle of the last season. So they started wrapping things up really nicely. And it was so when that ended, it ended like on such a nice, sweet note. It didn't end on a, 
we'll figure the rest of the storyline out in season eight. And then there was no season eight. I feel like I feel like Game of Thrones in the middle of season eight kind of got the memo like, hey, this is our last season. Wrap it up, guys. Wrap it up. Manage all the dragons. Next four episodes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we need everyone to die in the next 32 minutes. Yep. yep. <laughs> Awful, just awful. <laughs> it was like while they were filming, like guys, we need we need this to be a little bit more improv. Everyone's got to die or live, like within the next thirty two minutes. Wrap yeah. it up, guys. <laughs> George R. R. Martin stopped writing the books. D and D got a Star Wars deal, and they were just like, "Well, yeah. we don't want to do this anymore because we've got Star Wars to do." So let's just yeah. kind of check out of this mentally, and yeah. that's exactly what happened. Okay. Since we started talking about it, where are you on House of the Dragon? I'm caught up on House of the Dragon. Again, not because I'm super keen on it, to be honest. I don't know. We kind of touched upon it after we saw the pilot, or not the pilot, the first episode. Yeah. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's me. I don't know if it's the show. But I'm not really being drawn in by House of the Dragon at the moment. I will respectfully disagree with you a little bit. I thought season one went too fast. Yeah. I thought season two, the first episode didn't cure that. But I have to say, the last two episodes have gotten back to a better Game of Thrones style. Yeah. Where they've now broken it down. They've gone a little bit more local. Yeah. A little bit more granular. Yeah. And it it used to be like, we thought it was just going to be like Armageddon. Like, okay, everyone's just going to get the dragons in the air. We're going to yeah. have a dogfight, for the lack of a better word. And someone's going to win, someone's going to lose, and that'll be that. We'll wrap this up by the end of the day. And now it's they've really slowed it down, and they've really explained a lot more like, look, we got to be careful. We got to approach this the right way. We got to get organized. Like, we're not just going to go dragon on dragon. Like... And I have to say, like, the last two or three episodes have really done a good job of getting back to the Game of Thrones style, which is to slow it down, get to know the characters, add a lot of, like, little subplots, much improved from what I saw in season one and the beginning of season two. I agree with you, the third episode especially, but... I don't know. There's still something a little bit off for me. It hasn't hooked me yet. And I'm not saying it won't. I expect that it will. And hopefully it happens in the next episode or two. But I I do agree with you. I like that they've gone granular. I like that they're going a little more, quote unquote, strategic with the war. Yeah. Yeah. I love that confrontation at the end between Alicent and Rhaenyra. Yes. I need a little bit more before I'm fully on board again. Can I tell you what I think the problem is? Yeah. I'm I'm, I'm going to try to diagnose your problem based on your symptoms. I think there is no likable character in House of the Dragon. Game of Thrones was littered with lovable characters, right? Mm-hmm. Macy Williams was lovable. We loved Jon Snow. We loved the Lannister. You know, we had we had a lot of people that we were cheering for, even the dog, right? Like there were a lot of people that we were cheering for and a lot of people that we were cheering against. Hodor, that guy who was on the wall, who became the maester of the books and stuff, right? Samuel like Samuel Tarly. Yeah. Like there were a lot of people that we genuinely liked in uh, Game of Thrones. There's no one that we really like, I think, in, in House of the Dragon. We don't like Matt Smith at all. We're not no. supposed to. I feel like we're supposed to like Rhaenyra, but we don't. I like her aunt, right? The lady who is passed over as a queen. I like her and Corlys, the sea snake. They're actually very likable, but again, they're an elderly aunt and uncle, the most likable people. Their grandkids, those two daughters, Bela and the other one, are kind of likable. We don't like Kristen Cole. We don't like Alicent. We don't like any of Alicent's kids. I mean, maybe Aymond. I mean, we don't really love any characters in in House of the Dragon. There's there's no one who's really compelling. There's just dislike and more dislike. 
but there's no one that we're really cheering for. There's no clear good guy or bad guy. That I think is one of the distinctions between this and Game of Thrones is that even even the bad guys, Jamie Lannister was a bad guy. We kind of liked him. You know, like there were people that we liked or we didn't like them, but we kind of like got to begrudgingly like respect them a little bit. This doesn't have that at all. We don't like Kristen Cole at all. We see him as 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 a jerk, we, as someone who keeps getting promoted despite not being good. We don't like the king. We don't like, and I think that's the problem with this show is that it's less of a plot issue now. I think it's more of a a person issue. We just don't have any characters that we feel compelled by. Doctor Ethan, I think you've cracked the code. Have I? I think so because. I'm thinking about it having heard you say that. And you're right. There's no one that I'm rooting for actively. Not even on the downside, right? Like, no. we hated Joffrey, so we were actively rooting against him. Yes. Here, yeah. we're not even actively rooting against anyone. No. Maybe Kristen Cole. Maybe Matt Smith. Maybe. May- right? But even then, just maybe... There's no one who's swayed no. us one way to the right or to the left. Yeah. Like we'd like, I mean, Ned Stark was not in a lot of episodes, but we like the Starks. Yeah. Right. We like Sansa. We, there were so many people that we just, I don't know. Even the mother of dragon, what's her name? Targaryen. We liked her. Okay. She, she turned on us, but at the beginning, like we we're very, very sympathetic, right? She married the, Dothraki guy, yeah. right? We felt a little bit sad for her. What her brother did, we hated her brother. We liked her. We saw she became a good wife. You know, her Dothraki husband died, right? Jason Momoa. You know, like there was there was a real sense of, you know, concern for her. You know, alignment with her cause. We don't have that here. I think I think that's the missing piece of House of the Dragon is that the story is after a season and a half. We still don't have anyone that we're really kind of like and are rooting for. Yeah. There's no underdog. I think that's probably what my issue is so far, or at least no one that stepped yeah. up in that position. If we're now going to Amazon Prime, you talked about Outer Range. We didn't talk about The Boys. By all accounts, we love that show. I'm interested in seeing how they set this season up. Because this is the penultimate season, they've gone on the record to talk about how this is the the next season will be the last season. Yeah. I think the way they're going with it now, I imagine that they're going to purposefully end this season on some kind of big cliffhanger. I think we're going to see the showdown between Sister Sage and Homelander, right? That's that's where this is coming from. She's I mean, gonna it do would the be couple- one hell of a twist if she takes him down and she ends up being the big bad. Yeah, that's probably where this is going. Okay, now we're on Netflix. The new release this week was Axel F. Oh, man. Yeah. 40 years after Beverly Hills Cop, there was a Beverly Hills Cop 1 and 2, right? And 3. And a 3. What was this, like 84, 86, 88? Are those Something kind of the years? Like that? No, maybe 90. I think the third one was in the 90s. And somehow they came back. I saw it. I liked it. Uh, I liked it quite a fair bit. Really? Yeah. I don't think it's a must subscribe, but it's a strong mooch someone's password. It's interesting because Joseph Gordon-Levitt is is in it, but the old cast, Judge Reinhold, Paul Reiser, was Kevin Bacon in the originals? No, he wasn't. Okay. Bronson. Yeah, he's back. Bronson P. Show. I mean, what has he been doing for the last 40 years? Who knows? Serge. (laughs) Serge. (laughs) Axwell. Was was he in in all of them? Was he in all of them? I think he was in all of them, yeah. He was Balky Bartakamus, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. In Perfect Strangers. (laughs) <laughs> Perfect Strangers is 1986. I love it. All right. I want to watch Surge again. I love those scenes. Yeah. 
there. <laughs> All right. So, so what did you think of it? I watched five minutes of it, and tell me if if I'm wrong. Does it does it just start slow? Or was I just being too judgy about it? It starts like all the other Beverly Hills Cops does, which is an action sequence to just show you that, you know, Eddie Murphy is still Eddie Murphy being a streetwise cop who's out to get bad guys in Detroit. Yeah. All right. I I watched the Detroit scene and I was like, uh, I don't know. It wasn't captivating me, but you said it's, it's pretty good. Maybe I'll take another look at it. First of all, the plot is just a standard plot. It's not you're you're not going to be watching for anything super fancy, but the scenes that are supposed to be funny are funny. Yeah, Eddie Murphy's got endless amounts of charm. It's got some cliches in it. It's got some things which kind of subvert expectations. Joseph Gordon-Levitt's pretty good in it. I don't know. I enjoyed it. I thought it was a good action flick. I'm surprised they didn't release this in the cinema. I don't know if it would have been a top 10 movie, but I'm pretty sure it would have done better than most people would have expected. Really? Yeah. The other thing that we were talking about is on Netflix is someone we haven't spoken about in ages, Jessica Alba and Anthony Michael Hall in a Netflix film called Trigger Warning. So you clued me in on this. I wasn't I even aware that this had come out. Uh, and I certainly wasn't aware that it starred Jessica Alba. Yeah. Why do you think she's back in this? Like, it seems like a very... I can't remember the last thing I saw her in. Well, you know what? Lucky for you, I am the Picasso of IMDb. And Jessica Alba, do you think it's been Fantastic Four? No, she's got to have been after that. Wasn't she in like that surfing movie, like Blue Crush or Blue Wave or Wave Crush or Crushing Waves? That may be true, but I think you'll be disappointed to know how old that movie is. Oh, am I dating myself? I think you're thinking of someone else, first of all. But I'm looking at her trigger warning 2024. You know, she's got like one episode of this, one episode of this, like these aren't. And then she doesn't have anything since LA's finest 26 episodes in 2019 to 2020. She must have taken a step back maybe for her family or something like that. I think she did. I think she took a huge step back because she had family. And then, you know, she's got like this organic baby diaper company or something, right? The Honest Company. I think it's called The Honest Company, and it was uh, very similar to like what Gwyneth Paltrow was doing where she had, but it was aimed at like baby stuff. So I think oh, when she God. was having a baby, she got like very into like organic and natural stuff, and she couldn't find it. She created her own, and I think The Honest Company was bought for like a billion dollars. Okay. Well, there you go. Like it, like, like it made her dramatically wealthy that she's like, acting no 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 that's yeah. for the little people <laughs> that's, you know? that's my side hustle yeah that's that's my side hustle right we've seen that with a few people right like they're not in movies anymore they do like a little cameo or something so yeah this is definitely the first time that she's been back in front of the camera in a long time yeah a long time but again i the ultimate point is that that's out of her choice not because she's you know, that's, that's what overlooked. I understand. Yeah, that's what I yeah, understand. I feel like a lot of, yeah. I mean, it's a bit sexist, but I feel like a lot of women actors do that. Yeah. To be fair, on the other other side of the spectrum, the old school career spectrum was you're the hot girlfriend. And then once those roles dry up, then you turn into either the best friend or you turn into like the mom, right? Yeah. Like that's where you were. Now it's, it's the commando. It's the, like, you can be in, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. there's there's a whole new world of, like, female action stars. Even Allison Janney, right? I mean, Allison Janney traditionally would have played a grandmother role. And now she's, you know, like a badass, you know, fighting instructor. Yeah. So you've seen, like, more and more of this. So that's that's kind of the Alba. Alba reminds me of... 
Who was the lady who was in Tomb Raider? Angelina Jolie? No. Alicia Vikander? Yes. Like, they, they remind me a little bit of each other. Like, when I, whenever I think of Tomb Raider, I think that was an Alba. I'm like, no, it wasn't Alba. Is it was the other one, you know? Yeah, I can see that. We haven't seen uh, Vikander in a long time either, right? Yeah, I don't know what she's up to either. I mean, she should be in another Tomb Raider. I'm okay with them not doing another Tomb Raider. I'm going to tell you why, because I am, if you did not know this, the Picasso of IMDb. <laughs> she is in something called Rumors, something called Firebrand, Irma Vep. Oh, we watched that two years ago. It was terrible. It was a streamer skip. I give it a skip. She was, she was in Beckett, 2021, Green Knight, 2021, Blue Bayou, 2021. A lot of 2021 stuff. And then uh, Tomb Raider was 2018. That was kind of like the last big thing. But rumors is the leaders of seven wealthy democracies get lost in the woods while drafting a statement on global crisis. Wow, that sounds terrible. Is she the a lead on that? <laughs> Doesn't it? I'll read it again. The leaders of seven wealthy democracies get lost in the woods while drafting a statement on a global crisis, facing danger as they attempt to find their way out. So it's the Hunger Games starring the leaders of the G7? I mean, it sounds like a Shyamalan movie, actually. Okay, so it's Vikander, Kate Blanchett, Charles Dance, who I don't know by name, but I know by his face, Takahiro Hira. I don't know. It doesn't make me want to watch that movie. It says it's a comedy drama. I mean, it sounds awful. Yeah, it definitely sounds awful. So that's what's... That's what's happening on Netflix. But apart from that, are you kind of like down on Netflix? You know, I hate to say this, but I'm kind of down on entertainment at the moment. What? We just talked about like eight good shows. <laughs> we talked about eight potentially good shows. I'll save the commentary on The Acolyte until we're caught up. I'll save the commentary on The Bear until we're caught up. I mean, you actually raised a very good point on House of the Dragon. Yeah. So hopefully that kind of picks up. Yeah. All right. That is our ramble, the patent pending tirade about, I guess, everything in the in the entertainment arena right now. Indeed. I do think we should go ahead and watch Inside Out. All right. It's made over a billion dollars. There's got to be a reason for it. Despicable Me 4 is probably going to make over a billion dollars. We should watch that too. Should we be happy or worried that with this trend of these animated movies essentially being so popular, we're just going to see a bunch of animated movies now? I mean, they're, they're really just AI created movies. I'm not because how many movies have flopped? How many of these movies have also done terribly? So, I mean, the Garfield movie didn't make anywhere near as much. And, you know, I had that as my number two movie of the, of the summer or my maybe even number one movie of the summer. You did not. You didn't. Hold on. I'll save you from from making that statement. You did not have Garfield number one. I don't know where you had it, but I know that we when we did our big reveal, it was not Garfield number one for you. Hold on. I wouldn't have let you. I would have. We would have, like, stopped recording and I would have said, Pete. Pete, don't put Garfield number one. Hold on. I, I know you didn't. I like the idea that you think you Oh, thank Garfield. God. Yeah, it was my number two. <laughs> Despicable Me 4 is number one. But still, number two. Where number did I two, put Garfield? Ethan. Where did I put Garfield? Number seven. <laughs> That's. And even that might be too high. <laughs> I mean, dude, you know how hard I am working to try to get us to be the people that give the scores on on rotten tomatoes yeah and here you are here you are putting garfield at number two which is undermining all my efforts <laughs> <laughs> i swear i'm not doing this on purpose i just i, I, like, I had a good feeling they're like this guy this guy gave this movie a pretty good review 
Although he's the same guy who predicted Garfield would be number two. So <laughs> take, take out the, a pinch of salt. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? You had Furiosa at number two, and I don't think that's going to make number 10 either. Okay, but that is way more defensible than... The, <laughs> that is way more defensible number two than Garfield. That's true. That is absolutely true. <laughs> Where did you put Furiosa? Five. My delta is lower, but yeah. But Furios, that's, that's every summer. Every summer, I think we need an award for like the the Pete the Pete random. Last year, you only had nine. This year, you had curveball. The curveball. Curve the the predictees curveball of the year. Yeah, it's it's gonna be the Pete curveball. And year number one, you had only nine out of ten. And you still beat me, which is which is more on me than on you, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and this year, you had Garfield at number two. <laughs> oh man, I, I would That's I awful. would not have I would not have let you put that at number one. We, we definitely I would have said, "Come on, Pete, let's let's record this again." You, you let's can't take a step Gar- back. Let's take a step back. Don't let your childhood Garfield pencil bag influence you. What can I say? I really love lasagna and I hate Mondays. You must <laughs> You must have had like so much Garfield stuff as a kid. You must have had like the pencil box and like everything, the trapper. I had keeper. the cologne, I had the stuffed animals, I had the t-shirts, I had the comics. I was all over there's, Garfield. Hold on, there's a Garfield cologne? Yeah, for kids. I don't know which of those statements is weirder. The fact that there's a Garfield clone for kids or you had the Garfield clone for kids. Here's the th- here's the third part of that. I used to wear that to every middle school dance. <laughs> <laughs> and why wouldn't you? Why exactly. Wouldn't you? <laughs> that was probably acceptable like in third or fourth grade. I would say like seventh or eighth grade. Yeah, I was probably borderline at that point. That's when you start moving on to like Aqua Dijo or whoever it is. Yeah, I'd like to I'd like to know what your second clone was because I bet that was like a huge jump. Right in like yeah. scent maturity, it's time yeah. to get off the cartoon character clone and get on. Maybe you went to like Adidas clone. That actually sounds probably right. Yeah, that's kind of like uh, the the non Jewish version of like a bar, a bar mitzvah, where you're yeah. just like, okay, you're a man now. You can't be yeah. wearing Seven Up Cool Spots perfume anymore. <laughs> yeah. I think Adidas cologne is a good neutral like bridge scent you know yeah exactly all right pete so that was a very good ramble or diatribe however we're branding this uh overarching discussion of a lot of things absolutely we've got some stuff to watch in the future i mean in this coming week so i think it'll be a pretty big week for us we can do another ramble or we can talk about some specific stuff on our next episode Indeed, but in the meantime, if you guys have thoughts about what's going on in the cinema, if you really love the Garfield movie as much as I think I should, <laughs> tweet at us at FNS Podcast, DM us on Instagram at Films and Stuff Podcast, and as always, the best thing you can do, leave a comment below this video, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and any of the other YouTube jazz helps us out a lot. Indeed. Everyone, thank you for joining us this week on the Films and Stuff podcast, and we will see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Pete. Thanks, Ethan. Thanks, everyone. Bye now. Thank you for listening to another episode of Films and Stuff. If you haven't already, please subscribe and review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever podcasts are downloaded. Films and Stuff. There is no substitute.